Good morning. It's so good to have each one of you here with us this morning as we continue in our study of the 8th century B.C. minor prophets. Today we'll be looking at in the book of Hosea uh, in chapters 8 through 10. So if you've got your Bible, go ahead and open it up to Hosea 8, 1, and we'll start there in just a few moments. Uh, but first, we always, as always, we want to go to the Lord in prayer before we begin our study. Um, as I'm praying, uh, I'm just leading you in prayer, and I would ask that you would take whatever is on your heart to the Lord as we pray. Father, we praise your holy name. We thank you, Lord, for this day that you've given each one of us to serve you. Lord, we ask that you would guide our hearts as we open your word to, the, to your prophet Hosea that you sent to your people of Israel at a time when the ten northern tribes of the nation were far, far away from you and, and living in sin. And Lord, we just ask that you would guide our hearts in this and help us to understand where we are with you today, each one of us. Lord, help us to hear what you had to say to Israel in that day. And Lord, help us to hear you as you speak to us in our day. Lord, we pray for those who are sick, whom we love. Lord, we pray for we pray for our nation as we are nearing elections. Lord, we ask that you would guide us, Lord, in all that we choose, that we choose according to your will and your way. Lord, that we could be blessed by you in all that we do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The title of the lesson is The Sin Harvested. The dictionary defines discipline in that it's, it stresses both there is a positive type of discipline and there is a negative type of discipline. Positively, discipline refers to a regimen that improves a skill or a behavior. Negatively, Discipline refers to punishment designed to correct or admonish improper behavior. God, throughout Scripture, disciplines his wayward children with the aim of restoring them to faithfulness and godly living. In his covenant, for instance, with King David, the Lord, uh, written in all caps, which represents God's covenant name, Yahweh, promised to establish the king's throne, King David's throne, forever. But at the same time, he would, God promised that he would di disciple his descendants for their wrongdoings. Second Samuel 7. 12 through 16, we read, When your days are complete, speaking to King David, God speaking to King David, when your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you, who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, which was the temple of Jerusalem, which was built by David's son, Solomon. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. After that, I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me. Now here comes the discipline part. God promises to David when he or one of his sons or grandsons commits iniquity, I will correct him with the rod of men and the strokes of the sons of men. But my loving kindness shall not depart from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. And we know from the prophecies that come after this and into the new covenant scriptures 
that this is a referring to the coming of the Messiah, Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who will reign eternally with God's people. Now let's come down to chapter 8, verse number 1. God says through Hosea, Put the trumpet to your lips. Like an eagle, the enemy comes against the house of the Lord, because they have transgressed my covenant and rebelled against my law. Now, put the trumpet to your lips. Like an eagle, the enemy comes against the house of the Lord, because they have transgressed my covenant and rebelled against my law. Because of the people's sinful ways, God was saying that he was sending war to Israel. A well-armed, efficient, and effective fighting force would come swooping down on the land of Israel, the ten northern tribes of Israel, like an eagle. Consistently, in the Old Testament, the house of the Lord is a reference to the temple, at this time located in the southern kingdom of Judah or Jerusalem. But also consistently in the Old Testament, a man's house is a reference to his extended family, those for which he provides and is responsible. An attack on any one of the tribes of Israel is therefore an attack upon the house of the Lord. But since God is almighty, an attack on even one of the tribes of Israel is something which has been allowed by Scripture, by the sovereign God under his covenant with Israel. In hindsight, we know that the attack on the northern kingdom of Israel would come from the army of Assyria, located in the region that is today the nation of Iraq. At the time, Assyria was the most feared and powerful fighting force in the world. Set the trumpet to your mouth. In the 8th century, armies were summoned and directed in battle by the blowing of coded messages on a trumpet, or in the case of Israel, a ram torn or a shofar. The sounding of a trumpet is mentioned 23 times in the Old Testament and served two primary functions. One being a religious function, calling people to the feasts or to the sacrifice. And the second is a, is a, I lost my place here, excuse me. The second is a trumpet was to call people to war, as we see in Jeremiah 4 and 6, as the southern kingdom is called to war against Babylon as they are attacked. In this case, here in Hosea, the prophet is telling the people of his nation to just go ahead and sound the trumpet because the army of Assyria was coming and Every person in the nation of Israel needed to come before God and to repent to him before their sins, their unforgiven sins, made it too late to be redeemed. God was calling out to his people to face him because they have transgressed my covenant and rebelled against my law. He was using the army of Assyria as a disciplinary agent for the what we called a while ago the negative discipline. Now we come down to verse number two, where we read where God says, They cry out to me, My God, we of Israel know you. It was as though a war was being waged within the nation of Israel's soul. In Genesis 17, 7, the people of Israel were bound to the Lord by covenantal promises from the days of Abraham, their father. 
in Exodus 19.5. This covenant with God was reaffirmed in the days of Moses when God brought them out of slavery in Egypt. In Joshua 24.25, the covenant with God was then re was reaffirmed again under Joshua when God brought them into their national land, the promised land that they were living in at the time of Hosea. And again in 1 Kings 8.21, under Solomon, the covenant is spoken of when God gave them a united and strong nation with a permanent place for God's worship in his temple or tabernacle now under Solomon, which was located in Jerusalem. It was there for all the people of Israel, the united people of Israel, to worship God. That was the place that God had designated for that worship and the manner that that worship was to be conducted. Now in 1 Kings 12, 32 through 33, we studied a few months ago, following Israel's civil war and the 10 northern tribes' separation from the southern two tribes, the northern kingdom's first king, Jeroboam I, placed a golden calf, I'm sorry, placed golden calf idols at Dan in the very northern part of, of Israel, and at Bethel in the very southern part of Israel, just before you travel into the land of Judah. These were to be the centers of worship for his people. This established the legal precedence by the order of the king of Israel for the worship of idols throughout the northern ten tribes of Israel. In verse 5, God, Hosea tells Israel that God has rejected your calf, Samaria, saying, my anger burns against them. How long will they be incapable of innocence? The people of the northern kingdom have become infatuated with the pagan deities of the Canaanites. They occasionally offered sacrifices to God, but they frequently and preferably bestowed lavish gifts upon and observed the immoral sexual religious rituals of Baal and the Asherah. The people would cry out, My God, we know you, but they never devoted their lives exclusively to the one true living God, Gafe. From then on, the actions of their kings and of the people drifted further and further away from God's written law, which we know today as the Bible, showing that they did in fact not know God at all, such that in Matthew, 2723, Jesus, the Messiah, the King of Kings, would say, And when I, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now let's come on down to Hosea 8, 7 through 10. In verse 7, we read, They sow the wind and reap the whirlwind. Okay, this is God talking about the results of their actions and the way they lived their lives was going to bring God's discipline upon them. Okay, God has designed this world and He runs this world such that every single action that humans take has consequences, either positive or negative. In a similar way, God designed and guarantees 
that consequences are part and parcel of the spiritual realm as well. As we come down to verse 8, I'm sorry, let me let me go on. Wind is lifeless, moving air. For they sow the wind, and they reap the whirlwind. Wind is lifeless, moving air, but the heating of the sun and the cooling of evaporation have a consequence in this world, in the moving of the air that can have huge effects upon the world around us. We just saw these effects in, in the terrible hurricane that hit Florida. We see the effects every spring in the Midwest United States with terrible tornadoes that, that tear whole sides of cities away. God's covenant people were and are expending great amounts of energy in religious activities which seem on the surface to be pious. But often tragically, the truth is that they are spiritually dead, totally disconnected from God who brings the good things of life, including life itself. All their empty words of devotion to the Lord coupled with their blatant worship of idols and sinful practices will result in nothing short of an unstoppable storm, bringing destruction on their lives. Verse 8, Israel is swallowed up. Now they are among the Gentiles, like a vessel which has no pleasure. God's judgment would and will consume not just the nation's produce, but the people's freedom as well. War would come to Israel. Although some would survive the disaster, they would be deported as captives and slaves. They would lose all of their freedoms, and someone else would, would own their land and property. Verse 9, for they had gone up to Assyria like a wild donkey alone by itself. Ephraim has hired lovers. Ephraim was the largest and most influential of the ten northern tribes. Rather than turn back to God and seek his way, Israel and Judah, as we see in 2 Chronicles 28, 16, had both turned and tried to go and take make a deal with Assyria. Now God had expressly forbidden this in his law before the people of Israel came into their promised land. He said, never, never, never make deals with unbelieving nations. Such a deal would certainly involve Israel paying a heavy tribute price, taxes and indebtedness, to this pagan king who is lying to them and will turn on them on a dime. In God's eyes, this is just like prostitution. Or as he says here in verse 9, his hired lovers, the king of Israel's hired lovers, going to the pagan for help and advice instead of trusting in God in his ways, is a betrayal of our covenant relationship with God. Now let's come down to verse 10. Yes, though they have hired among the nation, they have hired among the nations, now I will gather them. And they shall sorrow a little because of the burden of the king of princes. As a nation would face, as, a, as the nation of Israel would face the ever-growing Assyrian invasion, Israel's government placed more and more oppressive demands on its people. Yeah, every able-bodied man was conscripted into military service. Burdensome taxes were levied to meet tribute payments, and to pay for their own war efforts. We see in 2 Kings 15, 19, and 20. 
This was Israel trying to make this work in spite of what God said through his prophets. He said they were thinking, well, we can we can circumvent these things that God wants to do against to stop us and to discipline us, and we'll just do it our way and we'll work something out. So you just need to work harder and pay more money and we'll be able to take care of this inside our own realm and our own understanding. Now, just think about this a little bit as we're coming up on an election here in the United States of America, an important election. Might we in the United States of America, America be seeing very similar things said by some of the politicians to say, well, God doesn't know what anything about this. We know a much better way to go than God knows. And we'll make it happen. We'll do it our way. And we'll do it because we will work harder and we will, t we will use more money and put more money towards defying God. Think about it. Now we come down to verse 11. Then Ephraim, okay, this was talking about the 10 northern tribes again, has multiplied altars for sin. They have become altars of sinning for him, the king. Though I wrote for him 10,000 precepts of my law, they are regarded as a strange thing by your leader, the king. He doesn't know a thing about my law. I have written thousands, tens of thousands of precepts in his, God has written in his scriptures that tell us the right ways for living. But some of our leaders have decided to turn away from us and to walk away. We need to think about that and think about what God's discipline will be for walking away from those things. In verse 14, for Israel has forgotten his maker and built palaces. And Judah, the southern two tribes, have multiplied fortified cities, but I will send a fire on its cities that it may consume its palatial dwellings. God says, I'll tear down all the stuff that you build, no problem. If you will not follow me, I will take it away. That's God's promise. Then, as well as today. Now let's come down to chapter 9, verse number 1. Do not rejoice, O Israel, with exultation like the nations, for you have played the harlot, forsaking your God. You have loved harlot's earnings on every threshing floor. Now let's come down to verse 7. The days of punishment have come. The days of retribution have come. Let Israel know this. The prophet is a fool. The inspired man is demented because of the grossness of your iniquity, because your hostility is so great. The tone of this argument is urgent, as it is with us today. If the prophecy, which we think it is, is, was delivered very near 722 B.C. The Assyrians had already taken control of much of Israel's territory. This may be why the worship center at Dan is not mentioned by Hosea. Only Bethel. Dan is up in the northern part, closer to Assyria, and their oncoming forces. They'd already taken that. They'd already taken that golden calf off to Assyria. In this case, the people of Israel were already experiencing the days of punishment and the days of recompense. I say that we are too. We're experiencing those right now. And we 
We need to understand that, and we need to move ourselves back toward God and repent to God and turn our ways around. Now let's come down to verse 16. Ephraim is stricken. Their root is dried up. They will bear no fruit. Even though they bear children, I will slay the precious ones of their womb. My God will cast them away because they have not likened that they have not listened to him. And they will be wanderers among the nations. It's probably the most terrible thing that can happen to a parent is to lose a child. And, and God is saying that as you build up your armies in defiance of me, saying you'll stop the Assyrians all by yourself and you don't need God's help, you will be burying your children faster than you can dig the graves. Makes us stop and pause and think. And pray. In chapter 10, verse 1, we read, Israel is a luxuriant vine. He produces fruit for himself. The more his fruit, the more altars he made. The richer his land, the better he made the sacred pillars. This means that God gave Israel a, a marvelous place to live, a place that would supply their needs abundantly and make them very wealthy and prosperous as long as they were following God in his ways. But the ten northern tribes, they had the very, very fertile Jezreel Valley that produced bumper crops when God provided the rains, they had more than they could, they could possibly eat, and they were able to sell much more to the surrounding nations. And as the land bore all of this fantastic fruit, Israel just made more altars to idols. And the richer they got, the better they put their money into these, these terrible idols and invested in evil things. Let's go down to verse 4. They speak mere words with worthless oaths. They make covenants. And judgment sprouts like poisonous weeds in the furrows of the field. They make deals with evil people. Verses 5 through 6. The inhabitants of Samaria. Now that this is referring still to the ten northern tribes. Their capital city is Samaria. The inhabitants of Samaria will fear for the calf of Beth Avon. Indeed, its people will mourn for it, and its idolatrous priests will cry out over it, over its glory, since it has departed from it. The thing itself will be carried to Assyria as a tribute to King Jarib. Ephraim will be seized with shame, and Israel will be ashamed of its own counsel. Now let's, let's, uh, let's go to the map. And let's talk a little bit about what this all um, means. Um, let me get my laser pointer going here. And then I'm going to show you some things on the map. And, uh, and we'll talk about it. Okay. This, this, what I want you to pay attention to is there were a series of invasions that came against Palestine by the Assyrians. Uh, the very you see they're marked here with a red arrow, a green arrow, and a black arrow. 
Okay, the red air in the, with the red arrow that saw we see that the Assyrian armies came down the east Mediterranean coast of Palestine, defeating the nation of Phoenicia, taking over its ports, coming down into Israel, uh, taking the passes through the mountains and controlling all of this main highway that ran through the south along the coast all the way down to Egypt, which is right off the map here. Okay. Now, that was, that was in process at the time that these words were written in Hosea. So the people of Israel, see, see this is the ten northern tribes, or is this area right here that I'm circling right here on the map. See that? Okay. This is where the ten northern tribes are. And they were seeing these Assyrian armies coming down and taking their entire coastland and all the passes through the mountains that had forts built in them. You know, you remember we saw a while ago that it said that that they had built forts to try to, and they were conf that was mostly done during the days of Solomon, and they were confident that they could defend ourselves by blocking these passes so that the armies can't get through them. Well, now the armies were taking all the passes, and they had a clear shot all the way through Palestine and all the way down to Egypt. And they were seeing this happen before their very eyes. Hosea described anxious and mournful emotions of the residents of the inhabitants of Samaria and they would that they would experience concerning their calf idol in Beth Avon though Samaria was the capital city of the northern ten tribes of Israel Samaria sets right here on the map you see Samaria Okay. See how close it was to where the Assyrian army came? It's up here in the mountains a little bit. And the army just marched right on past them and took the next pass at Aphel, Aphek, Aphek, I'm sorry, and the next pass at Gezer, and then on down. Okay. And so they got really close to the capital city. And though Samaria was the capital city of the, of the ten tribes of Israel, here Hosea used the term to represent the entire nation. As Israel's punishment for their idolatry draws near, God will no longer be leading Hosea to call them Israel, but instead either Samaria or Ephraim. When Jacob had repented and given, now let's, let's look at a little bit of past history. The reason God is doing this has a reason. These names, there's importance in these names. When Jacob had repented and given his life, Jacob was the father of the 12, his 12 sons were going to be the patriarchs of the 10, of all 12 tribes of Israel. Okay. And when God, and when Jacob had repented, finally, and given his life to God in faith, God changed Jacob's name to Israel, which means he contended with God, but he repented. Jacob had then built an altar to God in that place that's called that, that Hosea is calling Beth Avon, and he named it Bethel. Okay, it's right here under this this white box right here on the map. That's where Bethel is, okay? And it means, Bethel means the city of God, okay? Jacob's 12 sons would then become the patriarchs of the 12 tribes of Israel. Remember from last week's lesson in Hosea 4.1, God no longer called the people of 10 northern tribes his covenant people. But in his judgment against them for their sinfulness, he now called them only the inhabitants of the land, which is exactly what he had once called the Canaanites when he gave the land 
to Israel as his covenant people. Now, after pronouncing his judgment against the 10 northern tribes, God revokes the name of Bethel, which means the city of God, and, re and renames it Beth Avon, meaning the house of wickedness or iniquity. Everything's changed now. Ten of the twelve tribes have broken their covenant with God, and God was going to discipline them and abandon his covenant with them because of that. This place where in Genesis 12, 8, Jacob's grandfather, Abraham, had pitched his, had pledged his faith to God, this same place, Bethel, in his acceptance of God's offer of a covenant with him and his descendants. Those descendants now dedicated the place to idolatry, to Baal. Hosea is inspired by God to prophesy that the idolatrous priests who cry out over it, over its glory, will mourn for their calf idol that was now at the place that God called Beth Avon, the house of wickedness. As in just as few as 12 months, we are going to see, now let's look at the green line, the green arrows. We're going to see the Assyrian army in, in, in just about a year come down this path, this time coming right down through the center of the 10 northern tribes of Israel, branching off and reconnecting through highways that are there to connect with the highways that they had captured the year before. See that? They're making a network of travel through Israel. And as they're going, they are conquering more parts of the land. And finally, they come down to the Jezreel Valley with their armies. This is the Jezreel Valley right here that I'm circling with my pointer. See this? Here's Mount Carmel that looks out over the Jezreel Valley. And when they came in here with their massive army, they utterly destroyed the entire army of the 10 northern tribes. That army that they had taxed the people so heavily for and were, was filled with the sons of Israel, they all died there in that valley. And they, they had a terrible time. There was so, such slaughter that they had a terrible time even getting their bodies buried in that massive, fertile valley. It was covered with the graves of those young men from Israel who had fought against God and fought against God's discipline. And then they came on down to the very, and they split off and went over on the east side of the Jordan River and conquered the lands on the east side of the Jordan River controlled by Israel. And all that was left of the 10 tri northern tribes was the capital city of Samaria and this little bit in the northern tribes. Over half of the nation was now under Assyrian control. In seven. 33 B.C. And their, idolater, and their idolatrous priests will mourn for their calf idol since it has departed or was taken into captivity is another way to translate that to Assyria as a tribute to King Jareb. And as they came down here, they... they on the west side, they just went right over here and grabbed that golden idol and took it off to Assyria. And it sat in front of the king of Assyria. The tribute to King Jareb, which means the great king of Assyria, which is undoubtedly Tiglath-Pileser III. 
in absolute indifference to his prophecy from Hosea, the king of Israel would send envoys to ask for help from the great king of Assyria, tiglath pileser who was in the process of taking control of all the roads and the passes and the fortresses along the Mediterranean coast to Phine from Phoenicia to Egypt. Okay, I talked to you about that. That was the he was in the process of taking this at the time. What was going to come next was this second trip right down through the heart of Israel. The people of Israel were not ashamed of their rejection of the Lord or of their corresponding sexual promiscuity, their deceit and violence, but they would mourn for their calf idol when it was taken by the Assyrians and was carried away. Let's come down to verses 7 through 8. God says, Samaria will be cut off with her king like a stick on the surface of the water. Also, the high places of, a of Avan, the sin of Israel will be destroyed. Thorn and thistle will grow on their altars. Then they will say to the mountains, cover us, and to the hills, fall on us. Three centuries of authority in the ten northern tribes at the time were the king. I'm sorry, there were three centers, not centuries, there are three centers of authority, C-E-N-T-E-R-S, in, in the ten northern tribes at the time. They were the king, they were the capital city, and they were the religious establishment. The first that they would lose would be their precious golden calf in Bethel. It would be taken away from them. That is the part that God hated the most. Hosea condemned two of the three in addition to that, declaring Israel's capital city, Samaria, would be cut off or killed or destroyed, and their king would be powerless as it's translated in the Christian Standard Bible, like the foam on the surface of the water, or as it reads in the New King James, like a stick on the surface of the water. Hosea prophesies again that Israel would have no way to resist the great power of the Assyrian armies. Their only hope was with the Lord through repentance and faith. These consequences were the foolishness in thinking they could choose their own kings without consulting the Lord, as we see in Hosea 8, verse 4. According to their written covenant with the Lord, as found in written in the law of Moses, or as we know it in a larger realm, the Bible, 1 Samuel 12, 12. <laughs> The Lord Yahweh said he was their real national leader, not the king the people chose. Therefore, their hope for security had been misplaced. They would suffer the consequences of their follies. Hosea's prophecies were fulfilled in 732 B.C., when the Assyrian armies under Tiglath-Pileser III destroyed the armies of Israel in the Jezreel Valley, then in 724 B.C., when Assyrian armies under Shalmaneser V placed the city of Samaria under siege, and finally in 722 B.C., when Israel's king Hoshea, don't get it mixed up with Hosea, this is Hoshea, the, the last king of the ten northern tribes, was taken into captivity to Assyria under the king of Assyria, Sargon II. So, in a, just a short while from 734 to 722, about 12 years, 
is all Israel has left. Hosea's declarations in verse 8 of God's judgment on Israel ended with a description of the total devastation of, that the nation would experience. Their shrines and altars to their idols would be destroyed. They would see people begging, begging for an end to their lives because of the deaths and the suffering of their loved ones. Almost every city and town had designated high places where they went to practice their sexually immoral worship through their idols. Hosea called these shrines that dotted Jerusalem's landscapes the high places of Avon, high places of evil, meaning wickedness, the devastation allowed by God would be so thorough that their high places would become uninhabited wastelands where thorn and thistle would grow on their altars. The catastrophe and the suffering would be so thorough that the people of Israel will cry out to the mountains and they will cry out for a great earthquake to occur to not to, really, not to liberate them from the Assyrians. They've given up on that. That's too late. It's too late for that. <coughs> Excuse me. But they said they would call out to the mountains, to the earthquake, to cover us. And to the hills, fall on us to escape this horrible reality of what has happened to their precious land. Let's come down to verse 9. From the days of Gibeah, you have sinned, O Israel. Where they stand, will not the battle against the sons of iniquity overtake them in Gibeah? <coughs> the days of Gibeah is a powerful story from Judges 19 through 20. I'll give you a summary of it. You can go back and read it as you as just a little later. It's Judges 19 and 20. This story serves in this context as a paradigm of the religious and moral decay of Israel. Gibeah was a town in the area of the tribe of Benjamin, about 10 miles north of the capital city of Jerusalem. Gibeah guarded the final mountain pass between the 10 northern tribes of Israel and Judah. In this story of Gibeah in Judges 19 through 20, a man from the priestly tribe of Levi was traveling with his concubine. Now, this tells you something about the man's morality, who is supposed to be a priest to God. He's not traveling with his wife, he's traveling with his concubine and needed a place to stop for the night. He passed. A Jebusite. Now that this was, these were the people who at the time lived in Jerusalem. Okay. They passed a Jebusite village to find an Israelite town where they thought they would be safer than staying amongst the foreigners, the Jebusites. So they came to Gibeah, which was in, which was in the uh, tribe of Benjamin's area. And there, an old man, a Benjamite, invite them to spend the night in his home. And that evening, evil men in the city surrounded the house and beat on the door, demanding to have sex with the Levite. The Levite shoved his concubine out the door to them, and they sexually abused her all night long. The next morning, when the Levite went to leave, he discovered his concubine lying on the doorstep. He callously told her to get up, and then he realized that she was dead. The Levite cut her body into 12 pieces and sent a piece to each one of the tribes of Israel. The tribes of Israel listened to this immoral 
disgusting story. And they demanded that Gibeah hand the wicked men who did these things over to them. When Gibeah refused, the men of Israel fought against the men of Benjamin. Thousands of men died on each side in that bat in those battles. And only 600 men from the entire tribe of Benjamin survived that war. Now calling attention to the Levites' sordid actions and the wickedness of the men of Gibeah, Hosea declared that Israel to this day had continued to be spiritually bankrupt and morally corrupt. Of his own nation Israel, Hosea ashamedly stated, there they stand in their corruption. Will not the battle against the sons of iniquity overtake them as in Gibeah? God's judgment was upon all of Israel and would be like what happened to the tribe of Benjamin at Gibeah when it was nearly obliterated because and through its punishment for sin that they had committed against God and God's ways and God's word. Verse 10. When it is my desire, God says, when it is my desire, see the, the M and my is capitalized. When it is my desire, I will chastise them. And the peoples will be gathered against them when they are bound for their double guilt. United States of America, when it's God's desire, he will chastise us the same way. If we do not repent, and turn back to him now. The peoples, God goes on and says, the peoples will be gathered against them. Means that God will use other nations, the peoples, as tools in his discipline for the nation of Israel. As God is very likely to use other nations as his discipline against the United States of America. We're not told specifically the two transgressions that constituted their double guilt. But from the immediate context, we can assert. Apostasy, number one, one of those transgressions was apostasy in the form of idol worship. And number two, placing their faith in alliances with ungodly leaders and nations and human weapons rather than seeking God's will and trusting him only to select their leaders. In other words, selecting ungodly leaders. In Hosea 10, 11 through 12. We come to verse 11. Ephraim is a trained heifer that loves to thresh, but it will come over her fair neck, but I will come over. God says, I will come over her fair neck with a yoke. I will harness Ephraim. Judah will plow. Jacob will harrow for himself. This likely refers to a heifer walking about the threshing floor, separating the grain from the ears. These cows were allowed the freedom of eating while they worked, as defined in Deuteronomy 25.4. This is a picture of the liberty that Israel enjoyed before they had been taken into captivity. The problem with Israel was that the threshing they loved to do produced wickedness and reaped injustice. For the second time, Hosea used the metaphor, metaphor of the threshing floor to describe Israel's unbridled unfaithfulness to the Lord. They, see, the heifer just walked anywhere he wanted through the threshing floor, eating as he went, getting fat, on it with his freedom 
the days of unrestrained disloyalty would come to an end as the Lord declared he would place a yoke on the fair neck of his people. Israel would lose their liberty and experience the oppressive yoke of exile. They would lose their whole nation. Now, United States of America, with our sinfulness, we are already giving up much of our freedom. The evilness that we enjoy is stripping us of our freedom by God's will. He is allowing that. Open your eyes before it is gone and God takes our entire nation away. God promises that his discipline would bring both the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah in line with his will for their nations. But Jacob will harrow for himself. In, in other words, their, their, their father, Jacob, who, who fathered the, the 12 sons who would become the, the patriarchs of the 12 tribes of Israel, Jacob will have to answer for himself. Jacob repented and believed, and God accepted that repentance and forgave Jacob of all of his sins. We can do the same, and we will be able to harrow for ourselves as well if we will, as individual Americans, will repent and turn back to God and believe. While the remnant from Judah would be brought back to their homeland for the purpose of bringing the Messiah Savior to all the nations of the world. If you look at verse 12, God says through Hosea, So with a view to righteousness, reap in accordance with kindness. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord until he comes to rain righteousness on you. God gives us and Israel three strong commands for repentance. Number one, sow for yourselves righteousness. We know God's righteousness by reading the Bible. God's righteousness is written on those pages. We need to learn what they say and practice them. Number two, we must reap in mercy, which means have a loving kindness toward our fellow Americans. Care about your next door neighbor. Care about the guy who lives across the street. Care about all of your fellow countrymen with a covenant type of love like God showed to Israel. Number three, seek the Lord till he comes. Seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you. The Bible teaches us that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return. And when he comes, he will, this next time, he will come in power and for judgment. We need to seek the Lord until he comes. And when that happens, in his judgment, he will rain righteousness on us if we have repented and believed in him. Now let's come down to verses 13 and 14. You have plowed wickedness. You have reaped injustice. You have eaten the fruit of lies. Because you have trusted in your own way, in your numerous warriors, Therefore, a tumult will arise among your people, and all your fortresses will be destroyed. As Shalman destroyed Beth Arbel on the day of battle, when mothers were dashed in pieces with their children. Instead of sowing righteousness, Israel had plowed wickedness. Instead of reaping faithful love, Israel had reaped injustice. Instead of eating the fruit of lies, Israel needed to break 
up the hard ground of their hearts and seek the Lord in repentance and faith. God declares that he was going to bring about their destruction because they had trusted in their own ways, in your own warriors, in other words, faith in their military might. Therefore, a tumult will arise among your people and all your fortresses will be destroyed. As Shalman destroyed Beth Arbel on the day of battle when mothers were dashed in pieces with their children. Now, Shalman there, this is a prophecy by Hosea looking past the taking away of Bethel and making it Beth Aven. Okay, he's looking past that when he says Shalman. This is a shortened form of Shalmaneser V a coming king of Assyria who would place Israel's capital city of Samaria under siege in 724 B.C. Beth Arbel is a city in the area of the tribe of Naphtali just west of the Sea of Kinneret. This is likely the place where the, where the Assyrian army turned off of that of that road that they had made along the coastline of Israel and turned back toward Samaria to come across the Jezreel Valley. They were only blocked by the pass that was was setting at Beth Arbel. And they and these as these brave men fought there at Beth Arbel to protect that pass, they were absolutely destroyed by the Assyrian army. When, and in that terrible destruction, mothers, along with their children, were dashed into pieces. It's a terrible picture. This is what sin against God, prolonged sin against God, produces. It's a city where death reigns. In something and in verse 15, in summary, thus it will be done to you at Bethel because of your great wickedness. At dawn, the king of Israel will be completely cut off. The Hebrew word for cut off means killed or executed. Now, this is another prophecy by. Hosea, okay, and it, and it's beginning, he says, as it's done to you at Bethel, which means what is going to happen as the golden calf at Bethel is going to be taken back to Assyria to stand before the king of Assyria. Several of, it's a pronouncement of prophecy that several of the kings of Israel were going to be assassinated in these last few years of Israel's existence. Their last king, Hoshea, would then be captured when Samaria fell and taken back to Assyria. And we do not know what his end was. Uh, he was lost forever and forgotten. Let's pray. Father, we praise your holy name. Lord, we humbly come before you hearing these words realizing that, that you call for the repentance of, of every man, woman, and child in this nation of the United States of America, in just the same way as you call for repentance for Israel. Lord, we, we each turn our hearts to you. We know that you see our hearts, that you know our deeds, you know our thoughts. You know, Lord, what we care about. You know, Lord, what we love. Lord, and what we cherish. Lord, we need to bow ourselves down to you, submit ourselves to your will, under, begin to look and delve into your word just as we're doing right now and understand what your righteousness looks like and how you 
would call us to live as your people. Lord God, our hearts, please forgive us of our sins. Help us, Lord, to turn around and to, to follow you with every day and every moment of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Goodbye. It's so good to see you today. And we'll see you next week. Same time, same place. Bye-bye.